Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we are returning to the igloo that I mentioned at the end of yesterday's episode in which we tackled nether fortresses. So we're going from a fiery environment to a slightly more chilly one. This igloo has spawned in a very odd location because there are a couple of snowy biomes nearby. Technically, this part here is a snowy slopes biome since the terrain here is a little bit taller but the igloo itself has generated as part of this flower forest biome which it really shouldn't do typically you will find igloos on snowy plains and snowy slopes and they look like a simple house made out of snow blocks but they will often contain some very interesting secrets on the inside here we've got a red bed a couple of ice blocks as windows a redstone torch here, a furnace, and a crafting table. So these can be an interesting source of some early game supplies if you happen to spawn near an igloo. Nice easy place to sleep, crafting table you don't have to craft yourself, and a furnace to cook up some food. But if you decide to make a home here, perhaps you want to swap the redstone torch for a regular light source, or perhaps you want to do some smelting in the furnace. Both of these actions are actually intended to introduce a bit of a higher light level in this area, and higher light levels will melt blocks of ice. As the ice becomes water, it will wash away a layer of carpet, and this has a chance in some igloos of revealing a hidden trap door. I'm gonna put the redstone torch back for now since I don't want it to clutter my inventory. We've got all of this carpet and stuff on us now, but this leads down into what I think of as an igloo research station. And oh my goodness, okay, now we have to <laughs> we have to consider some other things about this area because this igloo research station has a zombie spawner next to it. That That is the most unlikely thing I think could have happened here. Oh my days. Okay, <laughs> so... <laughs> all right, this is a little different to what I was expecting. Normally this room is completely closed off, but this zombie spawner has generated right on the corner of this and has overridden some of the generation of this room. So there is a set of iron bars here in front of a zombified villager wearing a cleric's outfit. And normally there is a second set of iron bars here trapping another villager on the inside. This guy, if we right click on him, is currently a leather worker, so we could trade him some leather or buy some leather armor from him if we had some emeralds on us. And it's actually incredibly lucky that the zombie that spawned from here did not immediately kill this villager because that would have been a problem. But as we can see, there are a few chests around here. I will say that these two, the one next to the spawner here and this one here, which has basically overridden the natural generation of this room, are the dungeon loot chests that we're used to getting, right? So we'll have golden apples and music discs and that kind of stuff in here. This one has a couple of iron ingots, some string, a name tag, you know, all, all of that usual kind of stuff. But if you find one of these igloos with a trapdoor that leads down, there will usually be a chest inside of here, and that contains a few other ingredients. There is a regular golden apple here, and you will either find a golden apple, or you'll find an apple and enough gold to craft a golden apple. You'll also find some coal down here, maybe a bit of rotten flesh, some gold nuggets, that kind of thing. You will also find a brewing stand, which we now have the capacity to make since we've been to the nether and collected blaze rods. You just need blaze rods and cobblestone to craft one of these, and we will be doing that ourselves shortly. But this brewing stand will already contain a splash potion of weakness. And one of the other things you'll find in these rooms, which I'm going to have to simulate here since I didn't have the same generation that you normally would, is a sign on this wall. And you'll typically find the sign has these arrows pointing in two different directions, implying a connection between the villager that you will normally find trapped here and the zombie villager behind bars on this side. And this whole structure, this whole elaborate setup exists to demonstrate that you can cure zombie villagers. And that's what we're going to do today. So normally you'll find villages out there whilst you're exploring the world. But in this case, we have a unique opportunity to cure a zombified villager right away. We're going to remove one set of these iron bars. So the zombie will still not be able to escape this area, but they are going to be at least a little more visible to us. We're gonna take the splash potion of weakness. We're gonna get the local brewery advancement for that. And we're going to walk up to this zombie and splash the potion on them. You'll notice the potion particles start to drift up from them. Then we'll take the golden apple from this chest and right click on them. And at that point, a rather crackly, hissy noise will happen. They will start to shake and these golden particles will start to emit from them, along with the particles of the potion of weakness. We're going to place the iron bars back in here 
here because this zombie villager is now starting to cure. And another fact that people tend to overlook about this process is that the more iron bars you have around the zombie, if you've completely enclosed them in a cage of iron bars, and if you place a bed somewhere in the vicinity, that will speed up the process of a zombie villager curing. I'm going to put a clock on the wall here just to demonstrate how long this is going to take. It is nighttime right now and you'll see this villager has already claimed and is sleeping in my bed, but that should be totally fine. We're going to leave them to sleep there for the time being, and we're going to wait for this zombie villager to cure. There we go. We have got a new freshly cured villager and we get the zombie doctor advancement and as you can see from the clock on the wall that's taken about half the night so roughly i would say about five minutes don't worry about that noise <laughs> that noise was nothing just cave ambience noises that happen when there's a dark area nearby so this villager right here is now cured of the zombie sickness and is ready to emerge from their cell we can take the iron bars away and if i had to guess i would assume this villager is about to become a cleric once again they had that purple robe on them whilst they were a zombie. During the night, villagers will look for a bed to sleep in if there is one around, and during the day, they will look for sites they can work. So it turns out that some of the blocks we have crafted, some of the little workstations that we can use as players, are also workstations for villagers. And as you can see, with the sun probably coming up outside, judging by the state of the clock over here, this villager has now adopted the cleric's profession because there is a brewing stand right here, and that is his workstation. Now, if I right click on this guy, he is adamantly opposed to zombies and will trade you emeralds for any rotten flesh that you have acquired. He is also trading us redstone dust in exchange for an emerald that we give him. And he's also giving us a discount on those trades. You'll notice that the initial number of 32 is slashed through with a red line, and he's accepting 26 instead. This is a discount that villagers will give you if you have cured them from being a zombie. They will also gossip with any other villagers nearby, and typically you'll find that their trade prices get reduced for a short amount of time. This villager, on the other hand, owes us a something of a life debt, and you'll find that their trades are pretty much always discounted counted when we return to them. If you are the player who has cured them, then you will get a permanent discount for life. On a multiplayer server though, you will find that whoever did the curing is the one who gets the discount and other players will not receive the same luxury. So you may need to coordinate with whoever's cured these villagers if you want to get the best prices on your trades. So this villager here is a leather worker because of the cauldron block here. This cauldron is actually the leather worker's workstation in the same way that the brewing stand is the workstation for the cleric. We'll do a comprehensive episode coming down the line when we'll talk about villages and all of the different workstations that correspond to all of the different professions. But since these two villages are here on our doorstep, this affords us an opportunity to do some sneaky stuff with their trades. And I'm going to head back on up the ladder and return to my house carefully because I'm pretty sure some mobs will have spawned during the night. But we're going to return to the house here. We're going to head upstairs and I'm going to see if I have any spare books lying around. It looks like we probably need to take some from the chiseled bookshelf over here, so I'll grab three of those. And we need to craft another bookshelf, and from there we're going to add some slabs to that, arranged above and below the bookshelf in the crafting interface, and we're going to make ourselves a lectern. A lectern is the workstation for a librarian villager, and these are notable in their ability to trade you enchanted books. In addition to the lectern, we're also going to bring some paper with us, and you can craft some more sugarcane into paper at this point if you want to. I expect we will also need a couple more unenchanted books, so we'll bring those with us as well, and let's pop back over to that igloo. We are going to remove the brewing stand from this area, and you'll notice that immediately reverts this villager back to being unemployed. He's searching for a different job right now, and we are going to give him one by placing this lectern here. After a while, he will adopt the book cap of a librarian, this white robe here, and if we right-click on him, you'll notice that he is now trading us enchanted books for a single emerald. This is kind of amazing, because one of the things we can do with a cured zombified villager is get hold of some fairly expensive enchanted books with 100% certainty of the enchantment we're going to get on them, unlike the enchantment table. We're also able to get them for as low as a single emerald and a book per trade, and these villagers have the opportunity to even get enchantments which are not part of the standard enchantment table. Villagers are capable of trading you two additional enchantments you won't find through the enchantment table, and those are Frost Walker 
and Mending, two of the treasure enchantments that it's typically only possible to find otherwise by fishing, searching for enchanted books in loot chests, or trading with villagers. And you'll notice that each time I break and replace this villager's workstation, his set of trades refreshes and we get something different each time. He's trading paper and a Sharpness 3 book, where before he was trading us Unbreaking 1. So at this point, I'm breaking and replacing this workstation until he gives us the opportunity to trade for a mending book. Or anything else that I'm looking for. Obviously, we don't have to go with mending if another trade presents itself that is equally as attractive, but right now, working with the tools that I have, with the durability on them decreasing, being able to put mending on some of my other equipment is going to be very much worthwhile. And as you can see now, he is asking nine emeralds and a book for a mending trade. That's because his asking price to begin with was 34 emeralds, which is actually pretty expensive for a mending book. Typically, they can go as low as 12 emeralds, at which point the discount will be high enough that you'll be able to get a mending book for a single emerald. So absurd though it is to be throwing away this trade at this point when mending is right here in front of us, I have the patience to break and replace this lectern a couple more times until we get a mending trade that is a little cheaper. See, right now he's giving us a Fortune 3 book for a single emerald and a book, which is frankly pretty tempting, but I already have Fortune on anything that I would want Fortune on for the moment, so I'm still looking for that mending trade. Infinity came up for one emerald there as well, that's another desirable enchantment if you don't have it already. But once again, it is one that comes up on the enchanting table from time to time, so I think it's actually worth going for the enchantments that you can't get any other way. Silk Touch for a single emerald as well. Gosh, you're tempting me with all of the nice ones today, but... No, we're gonna hold out. At this point, he is offering me the other treasure enchantment that we could get, and that's Frostwalker. Frostwalker allows you to basically convert water blocks into ice as you step over them, which makes it kind of interesting traversing oceans and rivers. But we will absolutely have time to look at that enchantment in a future video. And at last, here it is. So I didn't take any notes of how long that took. I didn't look at the clock or anything. I'll be able to tell you from the footage how long it took, but I would guess probably about 15 or 20 minutes of breaking and replacing the lectern. But we got a mending trade for one emerald. Unfortunately, though, I neglected to bring any emeralds down here with me, and the only other trade he wants is a trade for bookshelves, which is also really nice to have. But I'm going to run back to the house, hope that I have some emeralds left in the chest. I think I got some from raiding shipwrecks earlier in the week. There we go, got 13 here in the chest. At least we can trade with this guy once. And on returning to the igloo, we can claim our first mending book. There we go. One emerald and a book gets us an enchanted book with mending. And you'll notice that this guy actually gains a little experience for that. He is a novice librarian right now, but as you trade with him, he will gain experience on this bar, level up his professional ability, and more trades will appear in this panel on the left. The other important thing to note is that now we have traded with him once, breaking and replacing this lectern will not change out his trades. You'll notice the clothes of his profession are still there, and when we place the lectern back in the corner, it hasn't changed anything about his trades, so this guy's trades are now locked in. The reason I brought all of this paper with me is that a librarian's starting trades can include a trade where they accept paper in exchange for emeralds, or either of the two trades here. Some emeralds and a book for an enchanted book, or some emeralds for a bookshelf. So if we had the opportunity to trade paper to this guy, we would obviously lock in any trades that he had at the time, but we'd be able to gather emeralds from him instead of just spending them. In the meantime, we may need to rely on this leather worker for that, but we do have a decent supply of emeralds and books, and since these books only cost a single emerald apiece, we are going to be able to get hold of a few of them before we run out of our current supply of currency. By the way, if it is night time and you need to sleep in a bed, but the only bed nearby is occupied by a villager, on Java Edition at least, I'm not sure if this is the case on Bedrock Edition, but you can right-click on the bed to kick the villager out and simply right-click on it again in order to sleep. As I said, we'll get into the mechanics of villages when we are out there in the world and we've found a different village, but since this was an opportunity right here on our doorstep, I kind of couldn't resist. Now, the proximity of this zombie spawner presents us with an interesting opportunity, because remember how that villager was zombified originally? 
it is possible to zombify them again. Zombies will attack players, but they're also programmed to attack villagers, and if they do that, there is a chance that the villager can convert into a zombie villager. From that point on, they'll be hostile to the player, they'll go and attack other villagers and convert them into zombies as well. Zombie villagers will also burn in the sun, meaning that a single zombie attack on a village can be pretty devastating to your population of traders. But if you're able to convert a villager into a zombie villager and cure them again, in controlled conditions like we have down here with a zombie spawner right next door, it's possible for them to offer additional discounts. But before we go on, it is important to note that difficulty has some bearing on whether or not your villagers become zombified. If I pause the game here and click on options, you'll see that our difficulty is set to normal. I left this on the default when I started up the world. I didn't choose any of the other difficulty settings intentionally so we could have this discussion a bit later. On normal difficulty, there is a 50% chance that a villager attacked by a zombie will convert into a zombie villager. The other 50% of the time, the villager will simply be killed. But at this point, the idea of losing our mending trading villager to a zombie attack that could prove fatal is not a risk I'm willing to take. And the difficulty setting has some effect on this. If we were to change the difficulty to hard, that would guarantee with 100% certainty that any villagers attacked by zombies would convert into zombie villagers. Alternatively, if you like to play on easy difficulty, there is a 0% chance that a villager will convert into a zombie villager. They will always end up getting killed. And for easy players, obviously, that's a bit of a double-edged sword, because obviously you don't want the villager's population to convert into zombies that then attack you, but the game becomes easier if you're able to cure some zombified villagers and get hold of some more desirable trades. We're going to return the difficulty to normal, but in future we are going to set it to hard and click that lock button, because in future we will be looking at mass zombifying and curing villagers for a little extra discount. I know it seems barbaric, it seems like kind of a wild thing to do to a group of people that are effectively Minecraft analog to human beings, but these are the mechanics of the game. This is one of the choices you can make when you play Minecraft, and really there aren't really too many downsides to it, aside from a strange sense of your own moral failings. But we're going to leave that for another day, since right now we've got what we wanted from this villager and we can return to the surface. Well, what an eventful igloo that was, and it is worth noting that not every igloo you encounter will have one of those research stations below it. That was a pretty lucky opportunity for us. But if you are interested in having some villagers closer to home, if a village hasn't generated close by to the area you want to start your base, or you simply don't want to travel too far away to get to the nearest village, it is entirely possible for you to find and cure zombified villagers more or less anywhere in the world. As you've explored caves or roamed the surface at night, along with the regular zombies that spawn, you'll probably also have noticed a couple of zombie villagers. When zombies spawn, there is a small chance that the game spawns a baby zombie, and there is, I think, an equally small chance that the zombie is a zombie villager. There's also a chance that a baby zombie spawns riding a chicken, but those aren't the circumstances I want to focus on here. But the sun is coming up and I have not encountered a naturally spawned zombie villager yet, so in the meantime, during the day, we're going to make some preparations. First of all, I'm going to pop my brewing stand down on here. It's going to look a little strange <laughs> considering that it's going through the neck of this bottle here, but considering we had the brewing pottery shirt as part of this decorated pot, I like setting up the brewing on top of that. Even though we got that brewing stand from an igloo, in order to enable brewing, we still do need a blaze rod, because that gets broken down into two blaze powder, and that goes up here in the fuel slot as fuel for the brewing stand. You'll notice that bar lights up there to indicate that the brewing stand is now powered or fueled. Next, we are going to need some water bottles, and we actually have three already that I simply fished up whilst we were talking about fishing. So those are going to go into the water bottle slots of our brewing stand here. Now, in yesterday's episode, I talked about nether wart being an essential ingredient for potion brewing, but the potions of weakness that will help us cure zombie villagers are the one potion that you do not need to brew using nether wart. Instead, we need a couple of other ingredients, a couple of which I have, but one of which I am missing. We'll need a spider eye, we will need some sugar cane to turn into sugar, and we will need a brown mushroom. And mushrooms will generate in some of the dark areas of caves, and sometimes on the surface in certain types of forests. You'll find them in tiger biomes, especially the old growth tiger biomes that have the tall trees and the pods all on the ground. We're going to swim back 
down the river to the dark oak forest that we found previously, since giant brown mushrooms will grow there. And taking down one of these giant brown mushrooms with their big wide brim is usually a good way of getting hold of a large supply of brown mushrooms. Yeah, in my case, I got nine from taking down that one. We can always look at how to grow giant mushrooms later. But if you're having trouble locating a natural source of brown mushrooms in the overworld, it's actually not a bad idea to try the nether. Even here in the basalt delta, there are some red mushrooms growing around here, and red mushrooms aren't a substitute for brown in the recipe that we need to craft. But as you explore, you will occasionally find patches of natural brown mushrooms just growing casually on the surface of the netherrack. Anyway, on our return, we can take a single piece of sugarcane and craft that into sugar. And now in our 2x2 crafting interface, we can put together a spider eye, some sugar and a brown mushroom to get a fermented spider eye. We're going to add that to the ingredients slot of our brewing stand and you'll notice that the bubbles on the left start bubbling and the progress arrow on the right starts moving on down. And after that's completed, all three of these potions will turn into potions of weakness, which normally apply a debuff to your attack damage if you were to drink them. In this case, we're going to apply some gunpowder to the brewing stand as well, and that will convert all three of these potions into splash potions of weakness that can be thrown at other mobs to decrease their attack power. That is obviously what we did down in that igloo to splash the zombie villager with weakness before we fed it the golden apple, and that is what you can do to basically any zombie villager that you find whilst you're exploring the overworld. The last preparation I want to make for encountering a zombie villager is to grab a name tag and rename it in an anvil. We can name it basically whatever we want. I guess I'll call this one Regis. <laughs> but the purpose of the name tag is really just to make sure that if we find a zombie villager, it doesn't end up despawning. As we run around the overworld, some of the mobs that have spawned in the distance will end up despawning. Once you get a certain distance away from mobs, this happens naturally, and any hostile mobs that are 128 blocks away from you will despawn pretty much instantly. Here is a perfect example right here. There's a zombie villager that will hopefully start to follow us a little bit. But if we were too far away from the house and I needed to go back and get a splash potion of weakness and a golden apple, then by the time I came back to this zombie villager, there's a chance it might have despawned because I got too far away. But we are going to name tag this zombie villager and that will keep it persistent in the world, preventing it from despawning no matter how far away we get, even if we get so far away that the chunks we are in right now unload. So in order to safely cure this zombie villager, we really need to get the other zombies away from it. So I'm going to try and carefully attack these guys, making sure I jump attack so that I don't accidentally sweep my sword and do some area of effect damage. Then in a nice clear area, I'm going to pillar up two blocks, and now the zombie villager will be unable to reach me, even if I stand over the top of him like so. And we're going to try and place some blocks around the outside of him really quickly. This takes a little bit of finesse, so it can be sometimes a little tricky to do, but the idea is that we are luring this zombie villager into a box that he cannot escape from. Once he's in there, we're going to place a torch in there, close off the roof, and another zombie villager is here. That's actually kind of cool. Well, maybe we can take advantage of that opportunity and we can craft some more planks and lock this guy in as well. Let's see if we can get him in over here. Another zombie is trying to get into the same box, but we can't do anything about curing these zombies. So there we go. We should just be able to lock him in like that. Perfect. We got two zombie villagers in one night. Now, having the roof overhead is very important because when the sun comes up, these zombies might start to burn if there is sunlight directly overhead. And since we have name tagged one of them, but not the other one, this one has a chance to despawn while the other one is probably going to stay there for as long as we want to. So if we have the option of curing one or the other of these, I think I'm going to cure the one who is not currently name tagged. Just checking around to make sure any creepers aren't sneaking up on me. I noticed that one over there, so I'm kind of wary of that. But if we splash this guy with a weakness potion and feed him a golden apple like so, he should begin to cure. And all we need to do is wait around here for long enough, and we should have a totally cured villager standing in this box. One minor problem we have, though, is that once this villager ends up being cured, it could be a target for the zombie in the neighboring box. So we are going to open out this box a little bit more, try and get him to track towards us, and leave a bit of a barrier in there to make sure that Regis isn't going to attack his friend in the cell next door. I have a couple of extra splash potions of weakness, but I don't have another golden apple, and I'm going to wait around while this zombie villager cures. 
And that sound effect indicates that the zombie villager is done curing. So let's open this up. Now he is a regular villager. We shouldn't have to worry about him despawning since he is not a hostile mob anymore. And those rules typically only apply to hostile mobs. So if we want to, we can let this guy out of his cell and let him wander around. Although it's probably a good idea if he doesn't make contact with Regis for the time being. This villager is currently unemployed and will remain so until we place a workstation nearby. So we can always choose a profession for this guy. And since he's been cured from a zombie, he's He's going to automatically give us discounts. But villagers won't have any kind of homing instinct until they get near to a point of interest. That could be a bed or a workstation block, but typically, unless they detect one of those in their immediate vicinity, they are just going to wander around randomly like other mobs do. In this case though, my house is actually full of villager workstations. The cartography table and the smithing table here are both villager workstations. So are the smoker and the blast furnace, the brewing stand we've got over here, the stone cutter we've been using. Even the barrels that I've used for storage in the basement are workstation blocks, so we can do a whole lot with this villager already. In this case though, I want to create a villager workstation that doesn't have any uses for the player, at least at the time of this recording. That's going to be a fletching table. We need two flints to craft that, so I'm actually using my fortune pickaxe on gravel to guarantee I get flint. And with four planks and two flint, we can make a fletching table, which will turn this guy into a fletcher. If I place the workstation down out here, he's just going to naturally pathfind his way over to that in a second. Give him a minute. And it turns out the villager had other ideas. He's going into my house and I'm pretty sure he's spotted some of the other workstations in here. Yep, there we go. He's become a fisherman. Well, it was pretty much inevitable with the amount I use barrels for storage, but here's something we can do to change that. If I block off the door to my house and the door to the basement around the other side, while he's outside, he won't be able to get in and he will lose access to that workstation. When the next working day comes around, he should revert to being an unemployed villager again, and then he might choose that fletching table we placed out there on the plains. In the meantime, I can come down here to the basement and in my precious materials chest, we can get another golden apple or alternatively, I can find an apple from my own supplies and eight gold ingots. And we can craft a golden apple, which we could feed to Regis after we've splashed him with a splash potion of weakness. Despite all of this activity, you'll see the name tag has worked and Regis is just standing in there. The name tag will only appear above the head if you're looking directly at them and they are within range. So we're not going to see that this is Regis most of the time, but pretty soon we will have another villager wandering around. So we can feed that golden apple, add the iron bars around the outside. We can add a bunch more more of those if we wanted to, but for now, we're just going to wait for Regis to cure. And in the meantime, our fisherman is still pining for his workstation through the back door of the house, but for now, I think it's probably a good idea to go in and sleep to make sure monsters don't spawn during the night. And you won't need to worry too much about skeletons or creepers going after your villagers. It's only zombies, zombie variants, and pillagers that will typically attack villagers, so we don't need to worry too much about this guy's safety if he runs into any other sorts of mobs, but it's probably a good idea to build him a shelter so that he he's not going to run afoul of any zombies. He's still a fisherman for the moment, but once the day moves on a little bit and the sun reaches a certain point in the sky, he's going to go and try to find his workstation. And when he doesn't find it, he should hopefully revert to an unemployed villager and we can assign whatever profession we want to him. I could help this process along by going in and breaking the barrel, but there are enough other barrels in there that he would probably just attach himself to another one. Although in this case, it does look like just being unable to reach the barrel is not enough. So let's take a look at another quick way that we can turn this to our advantage. So let's look at another quick way that we can disconnect him from his workstation, and that's to make sure that there is some distance between the two. If we put down a boat here, he should be able to get into the boat nice and easily, and we can row him down onto the plains. It'll be a slow process since we're rowing across land, but we can bring him back over here towards the cell in which Regis is curing. We'll drop him off here next to the Fletcher workstation, the Fletching table. Then I'm going to build a big box of spruce planks around him and the workstation. We're going to make sure it's still open so he has plenty of light. But if I now take this villager out of the boat, oh, he can climb up on the Fletching table, but look, there we go. He's adopted the Fletcher profession since he can't reach those barrels anymore. And having a Fletcher around is going to be incredibly useful because one of their trades is sticks for emeralds. And given how easily we can harvest wood here in our world, it'll be nice and easy to create some sticks, trade those for emeralds, and get a nice easy supply of emeralds from that. Not to mention, since this is a Fletcher that we've cured from a zombie, he's giving us a discount, so we only need to trade him 26 sticks instead of half a stack. And now Regis in here has been cured, we can look into some interesting trades for him as well. I wonder what kind of profession would best suit him. Perhaps we can bring out that brewing stand and turn him into a cleric. We're going to leave him in there until we've decided that, and we could set up some little market stalls around here to have villagers that we can trade with 
out in the open. But this has been a lot of interaction with villagers with whom we've not really had a formal introduction at a village structure. So I think in next week's episodes, we're going to go and take a look at villages and everything that they can do, probably talk a little bit more about potion brewing and see what other topics will come up. But thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide, and I hope you enjoyed Structures Week. This was a bit of a twist ending to Structures Week, but hopefully you folks enjoyed this early look at villagers and what we can do by curing them from zombies. Thanks once again for watching the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.